So the title is Music. Is it just a matter of personal taste? I'm telling you, Lou Reed's Perfect Day is a great song. And the album it's from, Transformers, is one of the greatest rock albums of all time. These words, echoed around the world by fans of the late singer Lou Reed, were spoken to me by a student in one of my music classes. Interestingly, just a couple of weeks before, most of the students in that class had vehemently insisted that music was a matter of personal taste. It was wrong, they said, to talk about greatest songs. It was wrong to say that one song was better than another. As a musician and teacher, this is not the first time I have come across this type of contradiction. In one breath, people will assert that in postmodern democratic societies, musical judgment that goes beyond personal taste is elitist, culturally unacceptable. But in another breath, they'll talk about greatest songs. They'll consult star-rated reviews. And they'll accept without question governmental and educational decisions on what music should be taught and funded. Saying one thing and doing another limits the value of both types of judgment. If my favorite song gets one star out of five, it seems like I've got pretty bad taste. But if I then dismiss that critical rating as elitist, I stifle conversation about the song. I stifle the types of conversations that we actually have in most other areas of our lives. So the question is this. Can we preserve individual taste while at the same time acknowledging that some music is in fact better than other music? I believe that people's personal taste in music often has to do with what the music does for them. The Guardian newspaper's Six Songs of Me project asked, music, asked, asked participants what music does for them. They asked, song, they asked questions like, what song takes you back? What song makes you feel romantic? What song makes you you? My students chose their six songs very much on the basis of who or what they associated with the song. So they would write like, things like, I like this song because it reminds me of driving with my dad. Or I like this song because I associate it uh, with getting together with my girlfriend. So what music did for them was very much to do with what they associated with the music. Importantly, musical associations are unquestionable, they're incontestable, which makes the preferences built upon them incontestable. I like Christmas carols. I like Christmas carols sung by cathedral choirs. It's pointless for you to question my taste in carols because it is built upon something which is undeniable. The association I make between the carols and my childhood. The value we give to these associations is what makes general judgments of musical taste so problematic. If you identify with the Spice Girls song, Wannabe, because it takes you back to your childhood, and a music critic comes along and says, well, that song is actually not that good. It seems as if he's saying, you're not that good. So how can we be comfortable in our musical preferences while at the same time acknowledging that the music we like might in fact not be that good, and the music we really cannot stand might in fact be very good. So here's the thing. I believe that general judgments like, this is a great song, will not contradict personal preferences like, this song sucks. If the general judgment is based on something other than what the song does for you, how it makes you feel. What if musical value was not simply to do with what the song does for you, but was also to do with what you do for the song? 
the attention you give it, how closely you listen to it. Our relationships with people are important, not simply because of how they make us feel, but also in terms of our commitment to them. What if the same were true for music? What if musical value is as much about the attention we give it as what it gives us back? This would create a space for general judgments. For while we cannot judge how a song should make somebody feel, we can judge whether a person is giving a song her full attention, whether she is attending closely to it. We can also judge whether the song gives her encouragement to attain closely to it, whether it invites her attentive listening. On this basis, a great song will be one that we listen attentively to and one that encourages our attentive listening. What do I mean by attentive listening? Listen to this excerpt taken from the Eighth Quartet by Shostakovich, a Soviet composer. It's written in memory of the victims of fascism and war, so that should give you a hint um, of what to expect. Imagine that the song evoked feelings such as sadness, desolation, despair, or maybe even boredom. This is because we associate sadness, boredom, desolation with slow descending minor chromatic sounds. When we approach music in terms of how or what we associate with it, I believe we are less interested in the music itself and more in uh, what feelings it gives us. It's not that we don't hear the music. Of course we do. It's that we do not attend to what we hear as our main activity. Where music is a path to certain feelings, we are more interested in where the path is leading us than in the pathway itself. Attentive listening involves making our attention to the musical path what we do. It involves putting our feelings on the back burner and simply trying to hear the music as well as possible. By hearing the music as well as possible, however, I do not mean listening to it in a white-coated, analytical, intellectual, cold kind of way. I mean listening to it with generosity. When we listen to people with generosity, we step beyond first impressions, feelings, prejudices, and we attend to what they are saying. We attend to their words. But we don't just simply hear bare words. We hear in those words a person, a person who is trying to do herself justice, a person who is trying to make sense of her world. Now, of course, sometimes, all we do hear is words. I mean, all the person's spouts are cliches, but I'll get to that later. When I phone my mother in England, she often gives me advice about how to look after myself, right? So I'm 50 and she's giving me advice about how to look after myself. When I listen to her with generosity, I move beyond those feelings of, oh my God, here we go again. And I attend to what she's saying. I attend to her words. But again, it's not just that I hear words. I hear in those words, thought. I hear her thought for herself. I hear a human being who is getting older, who is increasingly isolated, and who is trying to remember herself, in a sense, 
in her words or in her care for me. I believe the same could be said for music. When we listen to music with generosity, we suspend or put on the back burner those feelings that it gives us and we attend to the notes. But we don't just hear the notes, we hear in the notes what I am going to call the music's thought for itself. The notes attempt, in a sense, to make sense of themselves, to become responsible for themselves. Perhaps this sounds a bit wacky, but stick with me. As a performer, I have to put aside the feelings and learn the notes. Now, I can do this in one of two ways. First, I can try and hear the notes that I see in terms of their pitch, their duration, their volume, and I can reproduce that. But second, when I listen with generosity, I can try to interpret the notes in terms of their thought for themselves. In a sense, I can breathe life into them. Now, this isn't something I can reproduce, but it's something that I take part in. And in a sense, I, it's something that I invite my listeners to take part in as well. Now, now, what do I mean by this? Well, if we take the first note of that little phrase I've played, before it comes silence. Now, you could just interpret or decide that the, the sound is the sound that ends the silence. But you could also understand it as a response to the silence. So the note doesn't simply end the silence, but responds to it, meets it, thinks about it. And each note that comes afterwards is not simply following a pattern, but in a sense is a response to the note that came before, an anticipation of what comes afterwards. So the music, instead of simply a pattern, becomes, if you like, heavy with its own deliberation, its own thought. When we listen to Shostakovich with generosity, we hear in its notes a kind of self-consciousness, a self-awareness. This, of course, is not the case with all music. Some music, like some people, when you listen to them with generosity, all you get is cliches. There is no music, there is no self-awareness. Imagine if Shostakovich had written this. But he didn't. Here, we have a simple scale going back down, and another scale going back up, and then a little arpeggio on the end. A pattern that has been repeated over and over again throughout the centuries of musical history. Clichés. Something which would not actually hold our attention. But Shostakovich does hold our attention. Now the question is, how does he do it? He does it by disrupting the clichés. So he takes the first cliché descending scale and he adds notes to it. He adds foreign tones. He mixes it up. So we get... He then takes the predictable pattern, the rhythmic pattern, and lengthens the penultimate note. And instead of just going back up the scale like a lesser composer would have done, he gives us a twist. And goes one note higher. So instead of... We get...
And he does one last thing, and this is where I'm going to ask for your help. He adds a note way down in the bass, a held C, which is like a nagging conscience at the, the tune over the top. So can you sing this note for me? And you just keep singing it, yeah? Some music repels our attentive thought with cliches. Other music invites our attentiveness through the disruption of its cliches. It invites us to join in that disruption, that interrogation. It invites us to become thoughtful. How you feel, or how Shostakovich's music makes you feel, is a matter of personal taste. The question is, can you be asked, regardless of your feelings, to accept the idea, the general idea, that Shostakovich's music is great? I believe the answer is yes, because the two types of judgment, personal and general, are based on two different approaches. Personal judgment has to do with what the music does for you. Generalized judgment has to do with what we, the music, and ourselves do for one another. A great piece of music, a great piece of music is one that we listen attentively to and one that encourages us to listen attentively. My student from the beginning believes that Lou Reed's Perfect Day is a great song. Maybe it gives him a lift because it reminds him of driving with his dad who's a Lou Reed fan. Maybe greatness for my student is simply a matter of personal taste. It's to do with associations. But perhaps he has listened attentively to the song. Perhaps he has heard how the minor sounds at the beginning of the song subvert the major sounds of the picture postcard perfect day that follow it. Or how the cliched string and piano tune that ba da dee da dee da dee da dee da dee da dee da da dee da da are subverted by the weightiness of the biblical message you will reap just as you sow that follows. Maybe my student believes that the song is great because he understands that the song's capacity to nurture and to deepen his attentiveness is no more a matter of personal taste than is his own capacity to become attentive. Music aids our survival. It gives some people a lift. It lulls others to sleep. But music is more than just survival. It is also about our choice to savor and to deepen our aliveness to its sounds, sounds whose thoughtfulness encourages that aliveness. In becoming alive to music, we do not simply survive. We become alive to ourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs>